Well, I am excited to continue this series uh, through the study or through a study in the book of Acts. We're doing a 10 week series called Kingdom Adventures here at the Vineyard. We're going to be doing it all summer. I would invite you to read along with us this summer if you want. If you want to know where to read, I would encourage you to read the book of Acts this summer right along with us as we're navigating our way through scripture. And it's called Kingdom Adventures because throughout the book of Acts, you see the people of God doing amazing things next to uh, their, the co-believers and the early church and next to doing just amazing things with Jesus in a way, spiritual adventures and, and kingdom adventures. And we all respond even to that phrase, kingdom adventures in, in different ways, right? And we hear the word adventure and some of us get excited. We're ready to hike the mountain and take the hill. And others of us get a little intimidated by the word adventure. We're not, we don't really like change that much. We like to know the consistent things that we can count on. But I promise you, each and every one of us, if we reflect for a moment, all of our lives are, uh, they all include adventure, whether it's a new job or, or taking a trip or meeting a new coworker or a new neighbor, or it, whether it is hiking that 14 or kayaking down the Poudre River, which I would imagine would be quite the adventure right now with how high the waters are. We've all have different adventures and different experiences in our life and they create memories, don't they? Adventures create memories. I'll never forget one of the best presents that my wife Natalie gave to me. It, were, it was uh, two tickets to a Chicago Cubs baseball game in Wrigley Field. And for those of you who don't know, this is God's team. It's the best baseball team on earth. <laughs> I got one amen. Can I get another? Uh, I got another, all right. <laughs> Love the Cubs. I have always said Cubs fans make really good Christians because they were really bad for like 100 years. It just exercised our faith and our hope in this future reality. No, it was two tickets to the Cubs game. I'll never forget it because what this meant, we were in college at the time in Iowa and it meant that we had to go on an epic adventurous road trip. And as college students, you love, I mean, as an adult now with kids, well, I like them a little bit less, but I still love road trips, <laughs> right? And so we got up at like four in the morning. We blared the music, great conversation the whole way there. We went to the Cubs game. We were surrounded by sailors who were in port for the day, which made the game even more interesting right? The Cubs won. We went out for pizza, hung out in Chicago, and then we bought a bunch of energy drinks because we had to drive all the way back that night to our college town. It was an awesome, awesome adventure. And now every time I get to watch the Cubs, oh, this is cute. This is really cute. They're like dedicated. They're ready to, they're ready to go. Love it. I love it. Adventures create memories. <laughs> In a lot of ways, what we do with adventures is we, we circle the calendar in great anticipation of this coming event or, or this vacation that we're about to have, right? And we, we circle them on the calendar because we know there's going to be something unique and something special that's tied in to that event. And in this series, we're looking at 10 different kingdom adventures, 10 weeks studying the book of Acts. We started with kingdom adventures in the Holy Spirit. And how if you want to have a real kingdom adventure, it needs to be filled and empowered by God's Holy Spirit. Bristow, I think, did a great job last week talking about kingdom adventures in healing and the things that we can expect as we walk with God. And this week, we're going to talk about kingdom adventures in generosity. Kingdom adventures in generosity. Let's pray, ask God's blessing on this morning, and then we'll go ahead and jump into the text. God, thank you for your presence here with us. Thank you that as we drift our eyes off of you, you are always faithful to keep your eyes on us. And so I pray right now that you would speak to us. I pray that you would speak through me, that you would speak through the word of God, and that you would teach us about a kingdom adventure in generosity in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this morning I'm reading from Acts 5. And before I jump into the text this morning, I think it's important to mention that up until this point in Acts, the church is really, really new. It's in its early, early stages of even being alive. The church is, is a baby, really. It's in its infancy. And although you're seeing healings and, and seeing amazing preaching 
and lots of people giving their lives to God and starting a relationship with Jesus. It's also important to remember that the context of the church in Acts 5 is more like wet cement than anything else. It's very moldable. There's a lot happening in the early church and the integrity of that foundation is incredibly, incredibly important because it's what the context of the church and how God will continue to move on earth will be built upon for years to come. So it's very, very important to see what kind of foundation that is, uh, the early church is being built with. I think it's an exciting time to be part of the church. I mean, all kinds of people being baptized, all kinds of people coming into the faith. And then you land on Acts 5. And Acts 5, just full disclosure on the front end, is a tough one. This is a tough text to navigate and a tough text to kind of work your way through. Sometimes, in fact, when we're reading the Bible in our own devotional time, we get to Acts 5 and we kind of just want to skip past it really quick and get to Acts 6 and start feeling better about ourselves again. But Acts 5, I mean, you need to take your time and you need to work your way through this text because it's a tough one. And if you've never read Acts 5, I'm really glad you're here this morning so that we can navigate some of the difficult texts here together because I've always believed that church is a place where you can get answers and not just have to walk out with more questions. So I'm going to read this whole story, Acts 5, verses 1 through 11 on the front end, and then we'll work our way through of the message this morning. Here's how it starts. But there was a certain man named Ananias who, with his wife, Sapphira, sold some property. He brought part of the money to the apostles, claiming it was the full amount. With his wife's consent, though, he kept the rest. Then Peter said, Ananias, why have you let Satan fill your heart? You lied to the Holy Spirit and you kept some of the money for yourself. The property was yours to sell or not sell as you wished. And after selling it, the money was also yours to give away. How could you do a thing like this? You weren't lying to us, but to God. As soon as Ananias heard these words, he fell to the floor and died. Everyone who heard about it was terrified. Then some young men got up, wrapped him in a sheet and took him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter asked her, was this the price you and your husband received for the land? Yes, she replied, that was the price. And Peter said, how could the two of you even think of conspiring to test the spirit of the Lord like this? The young men who buried your husband are just outside the door and they will carry you out too. Instantly she fell to the floor and died. When the young men came in and saw she was dead, they carried her out and buried her her beside her husband. And I think the greatest understatement of this text, verse 11, great fear gripped the entire church and everyone else who had heard what had happened. I said, this is kind of a crazy story, right? I mean, it's kind of an interesting story. And, and uh, <clears throat> as I'm preparing, I'm wondering if we just need to pray again so that everybody makes it out of here alive this morning, <laughs> right? Like, let's just cover all our bases. You know what I mean? No, I mean, this is kind of an interesting story. I was joking with Bristow, who got to teach from the series last week. He got healing, Kingdom Adventures and healing. I like, man, I threw you a bone there and I took the short straw. I got the tough, t- he even had in his message this phrase, healing is good news. And I said, well, you know, I'm just gonna have a hard time coming up with a phrase this week because lying and dying just doesn't seem to work. <laughs> I had a lot of fun in preparation for this message, actually. I was in my office and I was like, we should get a theme song, 2008, let the bodies hit the floor, let the bodies hit. <laughs> New slogans and all kinds of things for the church. I have a lot of fun prepping for messages in my office. No, it's, it's just an interesting story. And I, I, you know, I don't even get what Ananias is thinking. That he could lie to God, that he could pull a fast one on God. It reminds me of little Gabby, my little two-year-old. She's still in diapers and when she messes in her diaper, everybody knows, okay? Because she can stink up a room. And you just look at her, you don't even have to say anything. And she just responds, no, I didn't poop in my diaper. And it's like, well, hold on. Nobody said anything about the diaper. Like, where's that coming from? And what do you, like, you think I can't tell? <laughs> Ananias lying to God is like my toddler lying to me about her messy diaper. It's just not gonna work. I'm 10 steps ahead of the game, <laughs> right? It's not gonna work. You can't lie to God. You can't try to conspire against God and think you're going to get away with it. Now, large percentage of the time, I would say 99.999% of the time, you don't see this kind of quick and immediate judgment. 
So those consequences aren't always there, but you can't lie and conspire to God and, and, not, and act like he's not going to know. But I get that Acts 5 is a tough text, right? I mean, I understand that this is a hard text to navigate. And I, and I want to say to you publicly, this is my commitment to you and to this church, that we are not going to cherry pick easy texts to read so that we always walk out of here just feeling really good about our, ourselves and our understanding. I am committed to teaching the entirety of the Bible. And that means when we're walking through Acts 5, although we're not going to teach every verse in this series, I'm not going to just skip the texts that are hard. I wanna be committed to even teaching the hard ones. I think it's valuable for us as followers of Christ to navigate some of the hard texts. And that is my commitment to you. But I realize that we can read this story, we can read this text and walk away with all kinds of questions. Like, God, what are you, what are you doing here, God? Are you serious about this text? I thought New Testament, Old Testament gods, I thought that was like a different gig. I thought Jesus came with unconditional love, full of acceptance, and, and everybody's just singing kumbaya, and he accepts everyone, loves everyone. Why is this story in there? What am I supposed to do with this story, God? Why did they die? Why didn't they get a chance to repent? And I think they're valid questions. I think they're normal thoughts. And even though I won't answer all of your questions this morning, I do want to take some time on the front end to talk about some of the craziness behind this text, because I think if we can handle some of that on the front end, then God will unlock some of the deep and inspirational truth that he has for us, that, that he would want you to walk out of this room with this morning. So here's a few things, a few answers to maybe some of those questions uh, that are rolling around in your mind. First, let's talk about some of the things that this text is not about. First, it's not about eternity. Acts 5 is not a text about eternity. I think sometimes when we read the story of Ananias and Sapphira or other stories where there's judgment involved in them, we can tie earthly judgment to eternal judgment and we can't do that. That's not what the scripture is saying. Even though Ananias and Sapphira experienced kind of this quick and immediacy of, of judgment in the moment, we are not allowed theologically because the text doesn't say anything about their eternal destination. In fact, if you wanted to guess, you could probably say that they likely made it to heaven because they were part of the early church. And nobody's leaving the Jewish tradition in first century AD unless they really believed it. Because it really changed your life if you wanted to become a Christian. Now, we, we can't know that for sure either, but you can begin to surmise some of that. The one thing that you have to land in your heart this morning is that this text isn't primarily about their eternal destination. We can't tie earthly judgment to eternal judgment. Those things need to stay separated. Besides, for early Christians, death wasn't the worst thing that could happen to them. In our Western minds, we sometimes really fear death. We really think it's the worst thing that could happen to us, but they were so solidified in their faith. They knew that if they died, it actually got better for them because they were just gonna go into the loving embrace of Jesus. So one, it's not a text designed for theological debate. Two, or excuse me, eternity, I just gave myself away. Two, it's not a, a text designed for theological debate. It's really not. Acts was written by a guy by the name of Luke. He was a doctor in the time of, of the early church, a very intelligent man. He actually hung out with Paul, who, who we read a lot about in the later part of the book of Acts. He's a very intelligent man. He knew his way around theological conversations and theological ideas. If he wanted Acts 5 to be a deep theological debate, he would have included all of the theological trappings. But he didn't. It simply is not a text for us to draw up all of these systematic theology ideas. And it's not a text for us to just kind of sit here and, and pontificate about all of these different things that it could mean. Instead, there's a deeper reality to what's happening in Acts 5. It's not primarily about theological debate. And I've, I've wondered, right? Maybe some of you are wondering too, why it's even in the Bible. Like why why include Acts 5? I mean, I, I'm into church growth. I'd like to see us grow and expand and plant more churches. If it's me writing the book of Acts, I'm keeping this story hush, hush. Well, listen, if, people, if the word gets out that people come to the vineyard and they start dying, we're gonna grow this church to 50 in no time. Like no one's coming here. But I've actually come to really appreciate the fact that the Bible includes hard stories. I've come to appreciate that, that the writers of the Bible are going to include the messy stuff. It helps me lean into it even more. It helps me trust the word of God even more because they didn't just cherry pick stories either. 
They put in there what they felt like we needed to hear. They felt, they put in here what were, they were inspired by God to write. And so it actually lends, I think, to the credibility of the text. The story simply, again, is not about eternal destiny. It's not about theological debate. But it was designed to show us a few things. It was designed to speak to us, even in our modern day. And I think a lot of texts in the Bible, if you're going to unpack the truth behind the message, if you're going to really begin to apply that to your life, you have to remember that context is key when you're reading the Bible. That context is key. What The bigger picture of what's happening, you can't just read one isolated verse and apply it liberally to your whole life. Context is key. You need to know what the writers were actually talking about. And the context of Acts 5 is incredibly interesting. And I think as we, de- as we dive into the context, it will probably enlighten Acts 5 a little bit more. So let's back up into the end of chapter 4. And I want to read to you a little bit about what's happening in the early church at the end of Acts 4, and that will kind of shed light onto how we can read Acts 5. This is how the end of Acts 4 reads. They're talking about the early church. I'll pick up in verse 34. It says, There were no needy people among them, because those who owned land or houses would sell them and bring the money to the apostles to give to those in need. For instance, there was Joseph, the one apostles nicknamed Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. He was from the tribe of Levi and came from the island of Cyprus. He sold a field he owned and brought the money to the apostles. See, this is what's happening right before Acts 5. This is what's happening right before Ananias and Sapphira. And it's so important to read Acts 4 and Acts 5 together because it tells you what's taking place in the early church at that time. Basically, the author is pinning Barnabas and Ananias and Sapphira against one another in the story. On one hand, you have this man named Barnabas who sells a field, gives it all, and does it with integrity and love and even humility, laying it down at the apostles' feet. And then he gets recognized for his generosity. I mean, his name is written in the book. And people have been talking about this story for a couple thousand years. Years. It was a godly recognition for his moment of generosity. And the other side, you have this couple who wants to appear a lot like Barnabas without the sacrifice. You have this couple, they, they want the accolades. They want the recognition maybe. They, they perhaps want the, the status that Barnabas got in the early church, but without giving what Barnabas gave. And the trajectory of their lives go in completely different places. The trajectory of Ananias and Sapphira is cut pretty short. By verse 6 and by verse 9 and 10, their lives are ended. And Barnabas goes on to do amazing things in the kingdom of God. He's planting churches. He's traveling around the world. He's mentoring key leaders like Paul. He's leading missions trips and just doing amazing things, amazing adventures in the kingdom of God. And it all started here in Acts 4. It all started with this kingdom adventure and generosity. So there's two things that I want to talk about this morning when it comes to kingdom adventures and generosity. Two things I feel like we can pull from the text. And the first one is that we are called to give extravagantly. We are called to give extravagantly extravagantly, to give like Barnabas, to give like the early church gave because irrational generosity changes the world. Irrational generosity changes the world. And it, and it really reflects God, right? I mean, God has been so generous with us. He's generous to give us his son in place of our own debts, God is generous with his mercy and his grace and his forgiveness and his provision, the way that he loves us with his power and his presence and his purpose. God is so generous with us. And as we learn to live a life marked by extravagant generosity, we are a better reflection of God and a better reflection of him to the world around us. If we look back at Acts 4, 37, we see this this verse that talks about Barnabas, it says he sold the field he owned and brought the money to the apostles. Barnabas sold the field and gave it all away. Gave it all away. Now I grew up in Iowa. Both my parents grew up on the farm. I know exactly what farmland costs per acre. Last time I checked in Iowa, it was like ten or $11,000 per acre. Man, that's rich. That's God's country. 
You plant a seed and it just grows, right? And I have no idea, commentators don't ever draw the line about what the ratio of farmland in Iowa to fields in Cyprus in first century AD, according to inflation and all that other stuff. They, they don't come up with that stuff for you, but I bet that it was a big gift and I bet it was significant enough that Barnabas felt it. I bet he wasn't just giving out of his excess. I bet it felt like a sacrifice for him to give that gift. Verse 34 says that nobody was needy because this was a common thing in the early church. This was so part of their DNA. They were marked by extravagant generosity, not just Barnabas, but lots of people who were part of the early church. It's this remarkable, like I said, irrational and extravagant generosity that they were known for so that nobody was in need. Nobody was in need. Can you imagine? Can you imagine what we could do if everybody started to give like this? Just, just let your mind just brainstorm for a while about the kind of needs that we could meet as a church if everybody started to give extravagantly. Think about the impact that we could have locally, regionally, and even internationally. I mean, you could almost pick a country, just any country on the world, and you could change the trajectory of their economy, their education, their health, because you could begin to impact them in such an amazing way, in a way where there's no longer a need in their midst. That would be an amazing story to be a part of. That would be an amazing church to be a part of. What would happen if we started to give extravagantly like that. I could brainstorm all day long about all the needs that I am keenly aware of in our community and abroad that we could change. We have some folks in our church that are a lot like Barnabas, actually. Over the last couple of years, I've gotten to know them, and it's just been amazing to watch their life of generosity unfold. This this family, they've set the bar, not at 10%, not at 20%, but 50% of their income to give away. Isn't that amazing? 50 cents of every dollar that they earn, they wanna give to the kingdom of God. And they recently told me that's like the floor. They hope the ceiling gets a lot higher than that. But you can bet that they're intentional about it, that they, they sacrifice part of their own way of life in order to get to 50%, that, that they plan and they strategize on how to give so that that number can continue to increase. And as I've gotten to know them, as I've, as I've watched their lives, I've also seen not just generosity, but I've seen their life be marked in other kingdom adventures kind of way. Because this has opened them up to all kinds of different opportunities with God. I mean, think about Barnabas for a minute. Acts 4, he shows up. God has a plan and a purpose for Barnabas' life. And in Acts 4, you don't get any inclination that Barnabas knows about it yet. He just sells a field, sees what God's doing, and wants to finance the kingdom of God to advance in the first century. And what God does is he takes that. He takes that moment of extravagant generosity and he says, Barnabas, this is just the start. I have a whole bunch of opportunities now that you've just opened the door to. You're gonna travel the world. You're gonna preach the gospel. You're gonna raise up leaders and plant churches. The purposes and the plans that God has for you will be opened up in more dramatic ways as you learn to live a life of extravagant generosity because you're demonstrating to God that your mission isn't gonna be defined by money, but it's gonna be defined by his spirit. That is a powerful, powerful place to be. Powerful place to be. Giving extravagantly always opens your life for kingdom adventures. I think the question then that we can wrestle with this morning and reflect on individually this morning is what does extravagant generosity look like for you? What does extravagant generosity look like for me? For you, maybe extravagant means starting. Maybe you've never given before. Maybe you, you didn't know that this was like a, like a Christian discipline, that this was a thing. And so maybe for you, extravagant giving is actually synonymous with starting. And if that's you, then I would encourage you to start giving today because God will bless that. And he will open doors for you. You know, nowhere in the Bible, I think sometimes in our Western minds, at least this has happened for me and it's happened for other people that I've walked with, is that sometimes we think that we'll start being generous once all of our ducks are in a row and we've kind of got life figured out. You know what I'm talking about? 
But it, it, it doesn't actually say that in the Bible. It, I, I can't find, maybe it's in opinions, verse, you know, chapter two, verse three, like once your ducks are in a row, start. It doesn't happen. It's not there. There's, a, there's another kind of idea that I've, I've heard thrown around, like once I pay off all my debt, I'll start to give to God. But that, that's not in the Bible either, guys. It's actually, it's actually not in here. God says that with faith, you take that step. That yes, it is a risk and God knows all of the emotional trappings and all of the places of our heart where, where we're wondering if we can trust God with our provision. But God says, give generous now, start the journey now and see how I'll come through for you. Man, that's freedom too. Because now you're beginning to trust in God and the almighty God, not just the almighty dollar. Maybe extravagant for you means starting. Perhaps extravagant giving for you means giving more than 10%. Like you, you've gotten the kind of the dutiful Christian thing down. You check that box and you've been giving 10% for a while. I think God would honor that. And God would say thank you to you for that this morning. But you realize as you read the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus took the Old Testament law and like blew it up to like notch 10. Did you ever notice that? Jesus came in and he said, you've heard it said, but I say. And so I, I actually think that, that 10% is kind of like the floor for us as Christians, that God's inviting us to even more, to even extravagant giving above and beyond that. And so maybe for you this morning, extravagant giving is actually increasing what you've already consistently learned to give. You can steal this idea from some of my friends. I thought this was a really cool idea. Some great friends of mine in Kansas City before I moved out, they opened up a special bank account. Same bank or whatever, you know, just opened up another special bank account. And every month they draw from their normal checking account into that special bank account. I think it started with like 25 bucks a month and they've gradually increased it over time. But you just set your number up, whatever your number is, and slowly draw into that bank account, but don't touch it until you run into a, a kingdom adventure and generosity type of moment. And it would, that money would just occur in their account time after time, month after month after month. And then they would come face to face with a, with a moment of generosity, a moment where they could reflect God to the world around them. And they would empty that bank account and pay for someone's practical needs. A car payment, a utility payment, grocery shopping. Somebody in, in dire need, maybe their car broke down and the expenses were just too much for them to handle. And in that moment, they could step in and be the hands and feet of Jesus because they were intentional over months to just grow that small bank account into something where they could actually be on a kingdom adventure in generosity. I love that idea. I stole it. I would encourage you to consider stealing it too. Many of you know my older brother died last year. And, and and when he died, he left uh, a will. We had no idea that he had a will. Nobody knew that he had a will, actually. And what happened was he actually wrote uh, me in as like the executor of his will, which I also didn't know. And when that happened, we had no idea what to do. My wife, Natalie, and I, we had no idea what to do. It wasn't a gigantic amount of money. He was just a couple years older than me. So he was in his 30s as well. Some of you were like, he's 30, he's in his 30s. Okay, I've been wondering how old I am. No, he was in his upper 30s as well. And he, he left us as executors of the will. And, and, and we were all of a sudden, we were like face to face with, what do we do with this money? Well, I've, you know, it wasn't a ton of money, but I had never seen that amount of money before. I grew up in the nonprofit world. Nonprofit, key word, right? We, had never, we didn't know what to do with that. So we started to pray, God, what do you want us to do with that? And we felt like God gave us a number to give away. And so we started praying. We had so much fun. God, where should we put this number? What kind of organizations, what kind of people, what kind of, what kind of nonprofits can we sow this into in trust and in faith that you will take it and you will do good in the world, right? And it wasn't hundred percent, okay? I just want to clarify for everybody this morning. God didn't ask us to give hundred percent. We didn't give hundred percent. So I feel very full of integrity with you this morning. I'm not gonna, like I'll make it through this message. So that's... Let's count to three just to make sure. <laughs> no, God didn't ask us to give 100%, but we gave a large chunk, a chunk that probably the number I wouldn't have come up with on my own. And we felt so blessed. We had so much excitement and internal joy when we gave that number away. And I will tell you on the front end, if you wanted to do this in your life, you're gonna make some people upset when you take a will and you're generous with it. We made some people upset and we didn't even care. 
because we felt like God was inviting us to demonstrate his generosity to the world. But it was funny because before we actually saw the, that number in our bank account, right? It was just like theory, it was just like legal theory. We had made all of the plans. We had, we had become intentional with how we were going to give. And then when that money actually dropped into our bank account, I felt this little twinge of temptation. Are you sure it was that much? Because that bank account looks pretty nice right now. And in that moment, I recognized it as temptation and we just cut those checks and we got rid of the money so that that temptation couldn't find a root in our heart because I could sense the enemy trying to wedge in between me and God. And I needed to, to declare to God and to the world that we were not going to let the root of the love of money take over the mission that God had for us. And it was a beautiful exercise, not only in generosity, but in freedom in freedom from the stresses and the pressures and even the trust that we can have in money. Money will not save you. Money has no eternal destination for you. And so we were able to exercise that will and give that away in such an incredible, incredible way. So as we continue the service and, and even as we close the service and we get into the next steps, you'll see a couple options there where I, I'm gonna encourage you to pray about what extravagant generosity looks like for you this morning and moving forward. Because like Barnabas, when we give extravagantly, there are all sorts of kingdom adventures that open up to us. Second thing I feel like we can pull from the text is that we're called to give authentically. We're called to give authentically. There's no need to front or have a facade or lie about what we're giving or, or anything like that. We can give honestly, we can give openly, we can give with a cheerful heart. The Bible says God loves a cheerful giver, not someone who's coerced into giving or a grumpy giver, or maybe in this case, somebody who's giving in order to get recognition or get something in return. Again, let's look at the differences between Bar, uh, Barnabas and Ananias and Sapphira. Barnabas in Acts 4.37, it says he sold a field he owned and brought the money to the apostles. This is extravagant generosity, yes, but it's also authentic generosity. With open arms, with open hands, laying it at the feet of the apostles with authenticity and with humility before God. And then Acts 5, verses one through four again, I know I've already read it, but let me repeat it. But there was a, a certain man named Ananias who with his wife Sapphira sold some property. He brought part of the money to the apostles claiming it was the full amount. With his wife's consent, though, he kept the rest. Then Peter said, Ananias, why have you let Satan fill your heart? You lied to the Holy Spirit and you kept some money for yourself. The property was yours to sell or not sell as you wished. And after selling it, the money was also yours to give away. How could you do a thing like this? You weren't lying to us, but to God. And isn't it interesting that this text is as much about integrity and holiness as it is generosity? It's as much about lying as it is about giving. It's about seeing Barnabas and, and wanting to be accepted and recognized and elevated like Barnabas is. And so you just kind of fudge the numbers on the side and create this story that makes you larger than life so that you can get noticed or get put ahead. But Peter addresses it right away. He says, it was yours to give or yours to keep. And even after you sold it, it was your money to give or to keep. You didn't lie to us, you lied to God. It's like a toddler lying to a parent, right? It's just not gonna work. But if you decide to give extravagantly, and if you decide to give authentically, your life will change. And you'll be part of changing the lives of those around you. There's no mistake that these two stories were butt up against each other. There's no mistake that these two stories don't impact one another. That's why you read larger chunks of scripture sometimes so that you can see the context in what you're reading because Acts 5 in and of itself is a hard text to understand. But when you see it in the light of everything that's happening in the early church, it makes a lot more sense. I wanna finish this morning with a quote a thanks and an invitation. First, the quote from John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement, who was a mighty man of God that, that planted churches all over. He said this, gain all you can, save all you can, give all you can. Gain it to save it to give it. And I, I love that quote. 
I love that quote. And look, sometimes, sometimes the church hasn't done a very good job of talking about money. And I get that. Sometimes we've hurt ourselves because there've been people that you've seen on TV and they, you know, or, or, or in other churches, they've promised if you gave, you're gonna get a thousand dollars back or you're gonna get that promotion. I'm not telling you that this morning. In fact, if you start giving, you might have to learn how to live on less. That's the reality. But Proverbs 11 does say that as you are generous, God will open up his riches to you. And I don't know about you, but I want heavenly riches a lot more than I want earthly riches. I want the riches that God is ready to dispense amongst his people more than earthly riches. But John said, gain all you can, save all you can, give all you can. And I, I love that. In fact, I, I think it's, it's really great because sometimes the church hasn't done a, a good job of talking to the wealthy either. Almost like we've tried to shame them for having a large bank account. That's not biblical either. It's not biblical either. God has blessed some of you with the ability to earn money so that you can walk this reality out, so that you can be extravagant in your generosity to the nth degree and change the world with your finances. But what I also love about biblical generosity is there's no line between rich and poor. Everybody can live an extravagantly generous life. It's just gonna look different. Because some of us have a lot of money in our bank accounts and some of us are paycheck to paycheck or we're really scraping to get, get by. But it doesn't matter because biblically, if you want to live an extravagantly generous life, you can no matter where your personal finances are at. Everybody can live an extravagantly generous life because every gift counts. Every gift helps move the ball down the field. Every time you act with generosity, it's a reflection of God to the world around you. Gain all you can save all you can, give all you can. My thanks. I want to publicly thank those of you who give to this church. And I hope that someday I get to privately thank you as well. But I want to publicly thank you for your generosity to this church. You know, every article I read, every book I read about pastoral succession and the guy who comes in and replaces the founding pastor, the, the, the cards were really stacked against us. In fact, almost every article I read said that in the midst of pan pastoral transition, people will stop giving. You should expect that. But this church hasn't done that. In fact, your generosity has been so consistent and it's continued in such a dramatic way that I've just been dumbfounded with the generosity that I've seen here. And I wanna thank you for that. I wanna thank you for that because you get it. I know that you get it. This wouldn't happen if you felt like you were giving to Rick or you felt like you were giving to Becky, and then you felt like you were giving to me. By the way, I don't see the dollars that come in, in case you're wondering. You're not giving to the pastors, you're giving to God. It says it right here in the text. And I feel like this church has owned that for a number of years, that you've known that there's a bigger thing going on, that you're not giving to people, you're giving to God. And so I wanna say thank you for the way that you've been generous. And I think God would say thank you this morning for the way that you've continued your obedience to him and continue to reflect him, even in the midst of this transition. I'm sure you realize this, but even if you don't, I wanna say it. It's because of your continued generosity that we can continue to do ministry here. Because of your continued generosity, we were able to hire a youth director. Because of your continued generosity, we were able to look at outreach locally and internationally in new and exciting ways. We're able to continue and actually raise the ceiling of ministry and outreach and what we can do here. And so I wanna thank you for that this morning. Finally, the invitation. If you're part of our church and, and you've not given before, I wanna encourage you to start today. I wanna encourage you to start today with whatever God puts on your heart, whatever extravagant generosity means to you, because I promise you that as you do, God will bless you. And again, not necessarily with another promotion or with a whole bunch of money that's gonna come back some other kind of way. That might happen, there are some instances like that in scripture, but more often than not, we're talking heavenly blessing and heavenly riches, the disassociation from the stress and pressure and lordship of money over your life and the embrace of Jesus as Lord over your life. That's the best place to be. That is the best place to be. So if you've never given, then I wanna invite you to start today. I wanna, start, I wanna invite you to start today. Simply put, when you look at this text, I believe that God will be speaking to all of us this morning that there is an adventure awaiting for you that has to do with generosity. 
And that as you step into kingdom adventures with generosity, that there's also going to be other doors to kingdom adventures that God is going to continue to open for you. And as you give and as you reflect a generous life, you'll be joining our church, you'll be joining the world as we join God's mission to transform all things. Let's pray and then we'll move into our time of response.